Good morning, Internet. Welcome to Royal Clarence. Well, I made it to Hull and back, and I'm here to tell the tale. Um, what can I tell you? Well, first of all, I think it was really, really interesting, the north-south divide in the UK. Now, I know most of my listeners are in America, but and I hope you've heard of the United Kingdom. <laughs> I'm sure you have. We're supposed to be really good friends. Um, and I've, you know, I have met people who I've said, I when I lived in Brighton, I remember meeting a, a wonderful American, a young American man who was um, bestowing gifts upon me, actually. At, it, we went to Vail. I didn't go to Vail with him. I was going to Vail with somebody else. And I met this chap because my colleague, well, he was a boyfriend, actually. He was skiing and... I didn't take to the snow. <laughs> I have actually had one of the worst holidays of my life in Vale. I had a near-death experience on the skis, trying to do the plough, and ended up on a ridge, and people were just screaming because I was heading for the ridge. Unfortunately, gravity uh, caused me to stop, but it was only gravity that did that. It was nothing to do with, with what I was doing with my feet. Um, my coordination on skis is absolutely dismal and I was surprised I was so bad at it and I looked so gorgeous because I spent a lot of money on my suit it was pink anyway um this uh, this young man was um chatting me up for want of a better phrase and uh let me just turn this mic down a little there we go it's a bit better um he was chatting me up and um he bought he was buying me cupcakes and things and he he worked at Vale um, in one of the bars or somewhere, I can't remember. But we were in another bar or breakfast room or something. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. But he had all these freebies, T-shirts and wonderful things. He was giving me all these uh, freebies that he... that was sort of um, merchandise that the, they give to guests. And um, he'd asked where I was from and I said Brighton. And he said, oh, that's in France. Um, but, of course, you it's easy to make that sort of mistake, isn't it? Um, Brighton, in case you don't know, is in England. Anyway, I went to Hull, which is, I guess, uh, five maybe 500 miles? Four, yeah, 500 miles from where I live, I think. Maybe 400. I should get my bearings, really. But, the, but there's this big joke in this country that we don't... Um, if you're a southerner, you don't know anything about anything north of Watford. And Watford is in London. And they say Watford because at one point, when this saying first arose, Watford was actually the farthest point of London. Well, now, Watford's, you know, no longer... London is, is much more extended now and beyond Watford. But anyway, um, I know very little about anything north of Watford. Um, and it was really intriguing to uh, to understand why. And we just don't get the same information. We d we're not told about anything. And I re I remembered that I thought Hull was very um, uh, dark. For some reason, I had this idea that it was a very dark, dismal place with which lacked culture. Well, of course, I was very, very wrong. I mean, I was going to an art event, so it was obvious I was going to be wrong. And I knew that. Um, but I'd known a friend who'd gone to Hull University, and this is about 30 years ago, and he he told me these things about Hull, you see, and they'd stuck with me ever since. Anyway, once you get, you have to go to London, so I had to get the ferry, go across on the ferry, and then I had to um, grab a train, and I had to do all these changes, especially on the way back. I had to get a bus for part of the journey on the way back, because the there was engineering works. Anyway, um, should I say there were engineering works? Oh, my diction, goodness me. Anyway, um, I'd, I had to go to King's Cross, so it was a tube, train tube, la la la, and I'd take my granny trolley because I thought that would be easier to carry it, and it, it sort of was, but there were an awful lot of steps because some of the tube trains, uh, tube stations and the undergrounds and the overgrounds didn't have escalators. So I had to carry the granny trolley. And there was quite a lot in it. My computer, my enlarging mirror, which is really heavy, and my makeup, which is, weighs a ton. <laughs> so, 
and of course my my new um, boots which were also ridiculously heavy so there was all of that so I was up and down stairs so by the time I got to um, London on the Hull train I was pretty exhausted and then I had to keep wedging the granny trolley in between my knees to try and fit in the Hull train was absolutely packed it was jam-packed and there was luggage in the aisles and it was so different to southern trains I couldn't believe it there was a lady coming round with an ash pan and brush and asking for your rubbish and she she was doing this all the way to Hull and I thought wow that's incredible they don't do that on south southwestern rail they um you know I I mean I've no idea why it's so badly looked after but Southwest Rail is has a terrible reputation, and I guess it's because it's so busy. Maybe. Um, anyway, we the the whole train got less busy as we ap- approached other places. We went through Doncaster, or Doncaster as they say, and Grantham. I think Grantham was first, then Doncaster. Um, and event three hours later, I'm in Hull. So the whole journey was about six or seven hours. It's very long, very very long. Um, but there were other ways I could tell I was on a northern in the northern territories. Um, the accent immediately changed when you got on the Hull train, because everyone's going to Hull, you see, because most of them are from Hull. Um, so that was really interesting and quite quite loud. But don't tell them I said that. But they were quite loud. So there was a lady adjacent, and I thought, don't make eye contact, because she'll start talking to me, and I didn't want to talk. I'm I'm one of those travellers that rather likes to just watch, you know, seen and not heard and all that. Um, so uh, that that was the one of the other things. So anyway, I got to Hull and it was actually fantastic, what a lovely place. But fortunately, the events that I was booked in for the meal and um, the shows, the uh, exhibitions and everything, were all on one street. So it was very easy to find everything. So that was good. Except, of course, I couldn't find the door in. So that was a little bit uh, awkward. So I couldn't access one of the premises. And you, it's, I've realised, because I've been in for what, two two years or something, two and a half years, I haven't really done anything. Because of COVID, I'm ridiculously out of practice at socialising and mingling. And I found it really difficult. I'm not going to lie. I... I'm very, very much a solitary soul now. I've become this rather exclusive recluse who um, is no longer sure how to uh, network, you know, all of that. The stuff that I... I can't believe I ran a club. I Absolutely. I've completely resorted to type. I've completely returned to my childhood uh, persona which was extremely reserved and watchful. And this was very interesting because when I was in the thick of being Patrick de Valentine and obviously I was in character and we, everybody knew that. It was a larger than life characterization, and I was performing as the Countess of Brighton and Hackney. And when I was doing all of that, I truly at certain points, couldn't tell which who was my, me, the real me, and who was the Countess. It was really interesting. And I guess, you know, when you're a method actress, which is what it was really, although it's performance art rather than a, um, a single entity production, a single film. But I suppose people who, uh, who work in soap operas must feel a bit like this, or pe- pre- presenters... I was doing a lot of presenting then. I'm seeing when I go through the archives now that I was, you know, I was a really extrovert presenter and interviewer. And um, I I guess I'd find that difficult now maybe as well because I was so out there, so obvious everywhere. And you have to be when you're, you're there sticking microphones in front of people. You've got to be really extrovert. But not just that, you know, I mean, when you're, when you've got 400 people coming into your club, your arts club, and you've got people coming from all over the world, you have to be this um, very much larger-than-life, caring... Cons- when I say caring, I, I mean, 
in, in the sense that you're making sure everybody's entertained. You don't actually care for them at all. Um, well, of course you do. So I'm joking slightly, but you know, you you it's rude otherwise. You know, when you're the when you're maitre d, when you're when you're the person who welcomes everybody into the club, you have to be very very concerned about their well being. Um, so that was something else I noticed. I noticed that there were because I was on my own, um, it was a bit cliquey, and I I find that quite difficult to cope with um, now. I don't like cliquey groups. They're um, it's very unkind. It's very rude actually to be like that. And I guess when you're a lone traveller. You and you're going to places on your own, unescorted. You're going to find you're always going to find cliquey groups, aren't you? These cliques who they don't trust you. Um, they don't know you. They don't trust you. So they're they're not going to engage with you. Um, but you know there were other things. A clique is a bit more than that, and it can verge on um, exclusion. And so as a people watcher, I was very intrigued about exclusions and exclusion zones and who was excluding. So I'm going to make some art about it, actually. Um, I mean, one has to make art when one is um, uh, pushed into feelings that are new. I mean, they're not new. I had that at school. And some of of the weekend, I think, was a bit like being at school, actually. Um, you know, trying to engage people, trying, talking to people and then they don't listen. They're not listening to you. I'm not saying everybody's like that. I met some wonderful, wonderful people, actually, um, who I hope I can connect with again. But I met some less wonderful people as well. And you know that thing when you talk to somebody and they're not listening and they're actually listening to someone else's conversation because they don't want to listen to yours. It's so rude. Isn't it rude? I mean, it's terribly bad manners, actually. Um, so I had a bit of that to deal with. But I, there was some amazing art, really. And I met a, I did meet a lovely, lovely lady I spent the day with, but she had to go, you see. So I was sort of left alone. And um, that was uh, slightly uncomfortable, I think, um, interestingly enough. But I had a great time, and the party was good. And I did get a marriage proposal. But, of course, I... You know, being told I'm beautiful and getting marriage proposals is no longer what I want out of life. Because I've, because I don't want to get married, and I don't, I'm, I have my own idea of beauty, so I don't need to be validated by a man anymore. Um, so you know, it. Uh, although it sounds quite good, doesn't it? A marriage proposal, I suppose. <laughs> I was 59 and I got a marriage proposal. I mean, of course he was drunk, but but he was, seemed quite sincere. <laughs> he seemed very sincere. He said, but I mean it, you're so beautiful. Let's get married. Come on, let's get married. Let's do it. I mean, he'd have been really surprised if I turned around and said, yeah, OK, then let's do it. He's from Liverpool, and another of the Northern Territories. Anyway, I the next day, so I was quite hungover on the next day. But my tummy was really good because I had a special bra on, an anti-reflux bra. So I had no problem with my digestion and I've been taking all my medication. So that was really good. So anyway, I, I slept like a log, got up, had the ghastly breakfast at the Premier Inn or wherever it was we were. It was a, a, the Lodge or Premier, one of those, um, which was perfectly fine. The rooms I have no objection to, nice and warm. Um, but no shampoo or toothpaste though um, and no bathrobes but you know we can't have everything um, so the room was absolutely fine I'd recommend it the breakfast was absolute dog food absolute dog food honestly um, the, I went for the croissants in the end the, the first I tried the scrambled egg and mushrooms I went for protein and then carbs because I had a long journey so carbs it was um so if you're going to go to these places maybe take your nice breakfast with you um so that you don't have to suffer the indignity of the dog food breakfasts <laughs> so um you've got to remember I've been all over the world I've been to some very nice hotels 
with the continental full breakfast, um, which, uh, you know, doesn't compare with what was on offer at my hotel yesterday, uh, Sunday. So anyway, the journey back, because it was a Sunday, darlings, never travel in England or... Well, I don't know what Scotland's like, but don't do don't do an England journey on the weekend if you can possibly help it, because it's the Saturday and Sunday when they do all the engineering works, and you I had to change about six times, and then I got to Hazelmere, which is miles from home, as it miles from Portsmouth Harbour, which I had to get to to get my boat. I mean, at one time I was thinking I'm not going to get back for my boat, um, you know the ferry. Anyway, uh, they put on a bus because there were no trains at all from Hazelmere. This place called Hazelmere. Um, so by the time I got home, I left at sort of 12. And by the time I got home, it was, I think, 8.30. I mean, what a journey. And the lugging of the granny trolley for, the, for all the, you know, all through the Sunday. And obviously set, uh, Friday. And then all the dancing because I did dance quite a bit on um, Saturday. And um, what else would I have done? Oh, yes, darlings. I had on Saturday morning a ballet class. Of course I did. I do ballet every Saturday with my daughter, and we do it on Zoom. So I, I'd done ballet, and we were doing, we were doing some um, plies, and... My thighs, goodness me. So as you can see, I'd built up um, a lot of, la what do they call it, lactose. You know, when that stuff that goes hard and hurts <laughs> in your muscles. So um, I, I was in quite a lot of pain yesterday. I, yesterday I had to stay in bed all day, uh, pretty much. I mean, I did get up uh, to make breakfast and things like that. But I literally stayed in bed. There's no butler around yesterday to serve me um so yeah today i feel much better i feel um learned because i connected with other artists from the futures venture um uh, alum uh, alumnus alumni i get mixed up i think alumnus no i think alumni actually um people who've had funding from futures venture foundation um, and it was the final party because that's the um, funding is all spent now. Um, it was lovely to connect and see such wonderful, wonderful work. And I will endeavour to share their work if I can find them. But if you go to my site, there is a Futures Venture um, channel and I put all the films on there. So if I find others, I'll um, I'll share them with you. Because it's, they're really special, the, the wonderful work. These are people who, for one reason or another, come under the radical heading and wouldn't have got funding otherwise by, by in traditional means. Um, so that's, that was really cool to hook up with those. And remember that I, my funding was for the Dominatist Project, which was really looking at women as sex workers and the creativity of that, and the misogyny that comes with it. Um, and in retrospect, there is... I mean, I didn't do it to get any funding. It was a labour of love. But in retrospect, I think it was really well-deserved that I, that I got the funding. So I'm really proud of it. Really, really proud of it. That whole experience. I'm really proud that I'm part of the Futures Venture Foundation. Um... So there we go. Um, we move on. It's the end of an era, rather, because, you know, it's the funding is finished. And if you want to find out about it, go to their website, because um, it stems back to the 60s, actually. Um, Radical Arts from the 60s. And uh, there's, a, there's a timeline to the things that occurred. So it's quite interesting. I might share that as well on the blog. Um, so, with the start of a new era for me, I think, as well, it sort of feels new now. It feels like the Dominatus Project is um, consigned, really, to the history books. The exhibition is over. Um, I'm making an archive of the exhibits, which I think is really important. 
So you'll still be able to get them on my site. Um, but now it's all about immersion for me at Telltale Club. So immersion is the um, the new sci-fi story and if, which I'm going to, I'm, I'm doing that slightly differently. Um, it's an adult version anyway, so there's a lot more violence and gore in it um, and sex. Um, and you really, it's forcing the uh, the reader to become director and choose the cycle of events that occur um, to this futuristic uh, character. But the wonderful idea of b- making the reader the director is a little bit different to role play. You see, with a traditional role play game, you become a character. But I'm going to do this a bit differently. It's a bit of an experiment. I'm going to ask the reader to decide scenarios whole scenarios so you go back to a place in time um and it'll it's going to take a lot longer to build obviously because i have to write it in real time um but i'll i'll persevere with that um so yeah and lots of music now lots and lots of music so um i'm gonna do some cello lessons today i haven't done any for about two two weeks because i've been so busy um so a bit of cello today and lots of special effects because the special effects are the money makers for me um, and the sounds and the music. So lots, lots more music today and back to the the new wave, the Telltale Club and the new wave of um, uh, what happened to the dominant artist when she ceased to be. She's always there. I might bring her back in uh, into if actually because um, she's quite a cool character after all. So that's my update for this week, and um, you can join me. Of course, I talk a lot. Um, I'm updating also all of the Countess of Brighton and Hackney videos, so you can go along to Full Bloom because they're a bit smutty. Um, so you can go along to Full Bloom and listen to those. So that's it and um, much love. Have a great day and I hope you don't get excluded by anybody. I hope nobody's rude to you and I hope you have a, a wonderful arty day of things today.